Well, thank you guys for coming. I want to give you, first of all, oops, I pulled the mic, here we go. First thing I want to do is give you a little, you know, idea of how I got to where I am. Um, all my life, I was a musician. I started playing saxophone when I was nine, played in band all through elementary school, middle school, high school. I, I went to Dunedin High, so I was wore a kilt. Um, and never really, I mean, I was in stage band and we had mics and everything, but I never really keyed in on the person who did the sound because I was a performer. It didn't really matter. Then I went on to USF as a music major for about a year and a half and decided that wasn't the right place. And then I came back and lived back at home and went to JC, started taking classes like in business. I took accounting, I took business law. I took two semesters of business law. I can't believe I even got through it. But, and, um, and then finally I found mass communications, journalism kind of things. And I went to USF, got my degree in broadcast production and programming. And while I was in school, here was kind of where my first job happened, your internship. You had to do a practical as part of your degree. So <laughs> the professor got me an internship at a little AM in St. Pete, 680 AM, Life 680. They played 30s and 40s, big band and nostalgia music. Their audience was 60, 70 plus. I mean, and they were a very small daytime station only. They came on at sunrise and went off at sunset. First day there, I have no idea what I'm going to do there. The first day there, they hand me a sold commercial and say, write it and get approval this afternoon. That's your job here. I was like, whoa. And I did it. The only things they changed were the items that they featured. I was like, OK, I can do this. And then slowly, I did, I, while I was in school, I took an audio production class where we actually spliced tape and taped it together. The, the teacher, uh, Chris Radhouse, did all the prom promotions for channel, local Channel 28. At the time, they were doing the big Titanic show, so he had that all done. He, he, he claimed in the class that he could take the T-W-E-N from one take and the T-Y from another take and put them together to make 20. We wouldn't be able to tell the difference. He did it seamlessly. And we were all like going, holy crap, that's pretty cool. So he taught us how to do that. Um, we had to record different things. We had to cut them down, taking the best takes out of what we did. We had to take a three-minute song and edit it down to a one-minute song, an instrumental. But even then, that's, you, know, you have to learn little techniques, and you have to cut the tape just right, and you've got to roll it back and forth and do all that kind of stuff. Okay. So after that, I worked at that station for, let me think. I, well, I interned for one semester. And then they hired me like part-time for about the summer into the fall. And was, I was graduating in the fall. And they offered me like full-time once I graduated. But then like in the meantime, I didn't, they didn't offer this until like March. And I got out of school in December. In the meantime, I had been looking at freelance video productions. And I found a company in Largo that would pay 10 bucks an hour for grips. I'm like, yes. So I gripped for them on three shoots, and the next thing I know, the boss calls me in and offers me a full-time job with them. I'm going to be a, a videographer and an editor. I'm like, OK, I can do this. And they want me to produce, so I got a, my writing skills from the radio station will come in handy and that kind of thing. OK, I can do that. So I do that for about two and a half years. I'm involved in I don't know how many different productions, from editing on, on location, doing gripping, lighting, dolly, camera, audio, anything. I mean, we were a small company. There were three of us. So me and the production manager, we did most of the work ourselves. You just learned how to do it. Um, in the middle of all that, the owner of the company died, and the production manager and his wife took over. And I was like, oh, it wasn't a great situation for me. So I, I started working with this gaffer. And he was like, well, why don't you quit? I pay my grips 150 a day. Yeah, I was working like 60, 70 hours a week for these guys, and I was making, I think I maxed out at 23. So I was like doing the math in my head going, dang, if I work 150 days a year, I'll make the same? What? And then I found, I met this guy, Rob, who did sound. And I was like, ooh, that's what I wanted to do, because I was always good at cutting the tape and doing all that kind of stuff. Even when I worked in the video production company, they kept me there as, you know, I was like the sound specialist kind of guy. I lost my tra train of thought again. 
So, um, so the, the owner of the company died. I started, I started looking at the freelance things. I went freelance and I decided to take the leap and become a sound man. I inherited a little bit of money when my father died. It allowed me to buy my first sound package, which was basically just a little three channel mixer, my boom pole with this Zeppelin. Well, not this exact one, but, and a couple lavaliers that I wired. No, no wireless. This was in 91, 92. Wireless mics were, were in their infancy. I still have the two that I bought back then. They're, they're fixed frequency VHF wireless. Um, they get little noises all the time if you use them. They have this little kind of noise that in the old days on a production shoot, that was my main job to stand there and go, no, we had a wireless hit on that take. Do it again. So that was, you know, that happened a lot. So I went freelance. I got my first gear. I was doing little things locally for telemation and different. Telemation was, at the time, was Home Shopping's production arm. So we did a lot of infomercials. We did a lot of product shots. We did a lot of things like that. I was doing tape op, things like that. But I really wasn't becoming a sound man yet until I started working with my one friend who was working on his his no budget feature. And I started working on his no budget feature and then I slowly got a reputation as a sound man. It worked up. And then one day I get a call from Telemation to work this political rally and I meet this cameraman, David. And David, like, the gear they gave me, I mean, this whole bag is portable. I don't need to be plugged into anything. The wireless, they gave me a wireless that had to be plugged into the wall. And he's just going, how are you going to do this? And I'm like, I'll make it work. I'll make it work. And I did. And he was very impressed. Two weeks later, he calls me for an NBC Dateline shoot in Bentonville, Arkansas. We go and interview the CEO of Walmart. Brian Ross has video of 12-year-old kids in Bangladesh making T-shirts with Made in the USA stickers on them. And they just deny everything. But I mean, for me, it was like I made more money in those three days than I had made in a month prior to these Thing. So I was like, yes, this is my place. And after that, I was a network sound man, at least in the news level. Production level, you still kind of had to work on it. But in news, I jumped up in that. So I've been doing that kind of stuff for, well, I started in 91, freelancing. And here I am. I do a variety of different things now, from news to commercials to industrials to political ads. Um, what have I done lately? I did a, I did a David Straz commercial, the mayor for, mayor for Tampa. I did um, a couple. Baseball's been really good to me this month. <laughs> the, old, the old li Yeah, exactly, from Saturday Night Live, Garrett Morris. So, um, so that's where we are right now. Um, so I guess that's really all I have for the introductions. Um, so right now, what I want to do is open up the, the floor to you guys. I want to ask you an open question. What is the definition of good sound? And to those of people who know me, if you know this answer, please don't spit it out, because I, I have a sp very specific answer. But I want to get your, just your general sense of what you think that is. Anybody? A sound that doesn't distract you from the story. OK. That's a good one. Anybody else? Come on. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. I would say clear, audible, and intelligible. All right, you're getting closer. You're getting closer. Anybody else? Come on. Think about it. What makes the audio good? I mean, camera shot, you can see a camera shot and you go, wow, that's a beautiful shot. Just because of the scenery or the way they framed it or whatever. But what makes the audio good? Okay. Okay, that's pretty much my answer, my standard answer, and I use it as my, my business slogan, is the absence of bad sound. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> turn your phone off on set. <laughs> you don't want to be the sound man whose phone goes off in the middle of a take. Oh, that's too funny. <laughs> All right, so other than that, let me see, where's my outline here? All right. God, this is going by quickly, actually. 
Next, I want to talk about some situations where sound is needed. There's only so, so many situations within the film and video world where you actually need sound. Um, for instance, like when they did Star Wars and they did all those special effects visuals, they had no sound guy standing there holding the boom for that. I mean, they wouldn't pay him for it. They just wouldn't. They just wouldn't. So the first one, most of the ones I do are interviews. And if you got one person on camera, you're going to put a lavalier on them, and you're going to boom overhead. Don't worry about that. That's fine. And this is what I use for booming overhead. Now, this is a very, this is a grip item. This is called a gobo head. You got to buy this either from a grip or lighting company. But grips and this is like on a C stand. All, all types of C stands have these. Uh, it's a pretty standard thing. This now, they sell these like a True Audio or Thai Audio in Orlando for $35. But I bought this in the fishing department at Sports Authority for $10. <laughs> and the only difference is that theirs doesn't have threads and it doesn't have this little hook. So it may, might be a little bit easier, but it's not that much easier. So you put that in like that. And then you just raise it up and down. Now typically, when you're doing this kind of stuff, and you, you have a sandbag like this, so it doesn't fall over, because you don't want your mic falling. Typically now, if I'm going to mic him right here, most of the sound, most people think the sound comes from your mouth and your chest. But most of your sound comes from the top of your forehead, right here. This is the vibrative plate that projects the sound. So when you're booming somebody, you just kind of work this into that spot and have it right over their forehead. And the more perpendicular you have it to the ground, the less background noise you're going to get. If you have it, some people, I've seen people do it, they'll do it like this. And that works, and that's good, but that's not the highest quality you can get. The highest quality you can get would be more perpendicular, like this. And again, if you're watching, I can, I can make shadows on him. You've got to be aware of your shadow all the time. If you're booming, if you're booming pretty much, you have the bright light in your face. Because then the shadow is going to fall away from you, fall away from talent onto you instead of them. So that's a standard interv sta um, interview setup. I'll show, let me show you the mics. The lavaliers, these are the transmitters for the wireless systems. These are Electrosonics, pretty much the name brand. And these are, these are big ones. These are old ones. The newer ones um, are totally digital. I mean, the display is digital. Everything's digital on it. Um, so you plug this. These are the lavaliers that I have. These are um, Sankin lavaliers. That's the actual microphone there. This little, just the little tip of it right there. This is um, a tool to hide the microphone, because nowadays in the reality TV world, they don't want any microphones visible, which <laughs> is the bane of my existence. <laughs> Hiding microphones is like the hardest thing because what will work one day will not work the next day, depending on their clothes. I had, a, I had one guy. I had his mic perfectly isolated. There was nothing touching it. I mean, I had balls of, of tape around it, so it was sitting in this air pocket, but his sleeve on his coat. He had a silk jacket on, and every time he went like this, it made this sound. And there was nothing I could do about it. Um, luckily, I had the boom over him, so that covered it. This is, this is always going to be your best microphone, always. So always, if you can, always boom everything. Even if they say, oh, we don't need the boom, just do it with a lav. You boom it anyway to cover your ass. That's all there is to it. So then typically with this... If I was going to do a news thing, a news story, they don't care if the microphone shows. So I'd use this little clip. I'll sh I can show you these closer when you get up after we're done. Um, let me think, how's this going now? So you would run this 
underneath their shirt and clip it on right here. I'm like sloppy today wearing his like this. But, and then with this hiding it, the microphone slides into this little thing. And then you get some top stick, which is two-sided tape basically. And you run it underneath and you can hide it like, you can hide it here or you can hide it here or different places. I've seen people hide things All types of different things. It's whatever works for you, really. There is no exact science as far as audio goes. So whatever works for you. In fact, I had to, I had to laugh at the opening of, of the, the promo of this on Facebook because it, it says dealing with real world solution. What, let me see if I can find it here. This part. <laughs> Useful tips from Industry Pro on how to record audio, such as how to troubleshoot potential noise issues, how to control environmental sounds. You don't control environmental sounds. You tell the director, we're waiting until that goes away. That's all there is to it. I've had shoots. I had a shoot with Lassie one time in Bartow at this house. And all I had to do was get the woman going, you know, because you get this heartworm medicine, boom, boom, boom. It rained all day, and the rain was so loud that we ended up, I mean, we were there at 8 o'clock in the morning. We were there at 9 o'clock at night still rolling and still trying to get one take without some rain happening, and it was crazy. And that was, that was the days before digital. I had a reel-to-reel -reel Nagra that I kept, I kept loading the tape in properly. That was another fun thing. You learn from another thing I learned from from my own personal mistake is shut up when you're on the set. They don't want to hear the sound man talking. If you have something to say, they'll listen. But you got to you can't be off on the corner chatting. You be quiet and be ready to do your job and jump into it when you're ready. All right. So the next next situation where sound is needed is is in news or kind of like an industrial where you have a guy a, a spokesperson talking to camera. We typically call that a stand-up. And, or at, like in the reality world, they call it a, an OTF, an on-the-fly interview, which it's not really an on-the-fly interview because we set it up and we light it and we do all this kind of stuff. So it's not really on-the-fly. An on-the-fly is where you walk up to somebody and you stick a mic in their face and, right. you know, that's, that's an on-the-fly interview. Um, I used to do a lot for Inside Edition in the mid-90s and we used to do what they called ambushes. We'd wait outside somebody's house and wait for them to come out and then run up to them, roll in the camera. And typically what you got was them hopping in their car and driving away. But it was, so it was kind of funny. But uh, a lot of times they did stop and talk to us. I did one story over in Orlando. Oh, this was a bizarre story. Um, a princess from India was staying at the Dolphin Resort. And um, she caught one of her servants stealing money from her. And she beat the woman with a shoe put her in the hospital. And there were um, Orange County and Seminole County deputies as security standing there watching it and didn't do anything. So we waited outside one of the cops' houses and got him coming out. And he's talked to us, actually. He's like, yeah, you got me. All right, I'll talk to you. But so that was one of the weird situation. Um, but now they don't call them ambushes anymore. Now they call them unscheduled interviews. Funny you say that because in 1997, after Princess Diana was killed, I was at a Buccaneers game running around, and I got screamed at that, that at me so many times during that period. It was ridiculous. You know, they were like, you guys are media. I'm like, yeah. So <laughs> I work hard for this. All right. So typically with stand-ups, you've just got a guy talking to camera. You'll have a lob on him, but again, I would boom him. Sometimes you may have to hold the boom if they're moving and walking, or you can put it on the stand if, it's, if, they're, not, if they're stationary. But it's, that's really not too hard, and usually you get to sit on the ground somewhere with your mixer, and you're just sitting here with your bag going, okay, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, okay, you know. So you don't have any problems with that. 
All right, well, the, the next situation is pretty much feature film, dialogue. It's kind of, again, the, the, the technology with wireless, oops, I keep hitting your mic, sorry. The technology with wireless has come so far that it's just not kind of assumed, just put a wireless on them. But wireless are expensive. I mean, I've worked with bags. I worked on the reality TV show, um, oh gosh, Siesta Key. We had three sound mixers on that show, each with a seven-channel mixer recorder running a boom and seven wireless. Crazy. 21 people on mic. Six cameras. Everything's synced. We don't have to slate anything. I mean, they have little boxes now that just ride on the camera that provide the time code. Through it. it's, just, it's just insane. But it was just... There's so much there. So I can't imagine the editor. I really just can't imagine the editor. That's, so that's the, the expectation is just put a wireless on everybody. But again, your boom is your best microphone. The features I've worked on, I use this, I go to this first. Unless the situation dictates that the wide shot, which is typical. And especially in, I think that in the reality TV world, when they got three or four cameras, they got one that's on a medium shot, but they got one that's in this weird angle wide shot that they cut to every once in a while and they want to have it clean. They don't want to see a microphone in the shot. And if you're standing there like this, they're like, what the hell is the boom in the shot for? So it, that doesn't work. But most of it's going to be feature film. And I think feature film, you're going to want to use the boom. You're going to want to have that ready and you're going to need this. Because you're the, well, I mean, again, you can, you can sync to the camera, which I will explain that a little bit t later. That's, um, but the boom is still your best mic as far as any kind of dialogue you're going to get. All right, well, the next situation is sound effects. I've recently, this is one of the commercials, one of the things I want to show you guys. I've recently got a couple calls, like a show, it's a commercial. All right, I get there, and they're like, well, there's no dialogue. And I'm like, there's no dialogue? There's nobody on camera. Well, nobody talking on camera. I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be an easy day, you know. And they go, well, we want you to get sound effects. Okay. Literally, one, I did a commercial. I got the sound effect of a guy walking on the carpet. First rule of thumb freelancing is you never say, hey, there's no reason for me to be here. <laughs> there's all, if you're getting paid, you're there. That's all I got to say. So this is one of the spots I did. Here, shot this in Clearwater at, at Jack Russell Stadium, the old Jack Russell Stadium. And um, I want to see if you can pick out the parts. So they actually did use some of my audio in this, but not much. And the reason they didn't, because it's, it's going to be shown in Canada. And they said, well, if we show it in Canada, we have to do it in French as well. And I said, well, what's the hard thing about getting somebody who speaks French? Oh, no, no, it can't be just any French. It has to be Canadian, Quebec in French. OK, all right, I'll let you go there. So this is the commercial. You got your new Samsung Galaxy S9 from Rogers, just like Kevin Pillar, which means you also got a free Samsung wireless charging stand exclusively from Rogers, just like Kevin Pillar. Oh. So you've got a phone that lets you shoot super slow-mo video just like Kevin Pillar. OK, even though you're not just like Kevin Pillar, you can get more, like a free Samsung wireless charging stand when you buy the Galaxy S9 from Rogers. So it took a whole day to shoot that. <laughs> and um, literally the sound that they used that I recorded. How do you record the glass when you're running on the grass? Do you put the zoom down? Or you just kind of stand there and let them go through. But again, I'm recording it and I got people yelling directions at him. I got the lighting guys yelling things, the camera department yelling back and forth. You know, they're, they're just, it's, not, it's not an ideal situation for sound, but they know I'm there and they want me there. So I'm like, okay. So of that commercial, two or three of the sounds that I recorded were actually used. The guy going, ooh, where he hands the phones off, that was, that was real. And then when he hits the ground and then the ball's hitting, that's, that's, that was what I got paid the day to get for that commercial. <clears throat> so, you know, I did another one 
just recently for Adidas at the Yankee Stadium, and they had the guy hitting balls of ice. And so that's what I recorded, was him hitting the balls of ice. So keep an eye out for that commercial. And then what was another one I did? Um, a Nike commercial with the women's soccer team at Raymond James. That was a cool one because they, the, they had a 50 foot crane. And they had the camera mounted on the crane and the girls run to the camera and the crane just goes like that all the way 50 feet until it, until it was like, you know, only like 10 feet long. That was really cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. All right. Oh, here's, here's an interesting one. If you're going to work in the news business, you're going to have to do press conferences. Press conferences, in general, are not very difficult for audio. A lot of times, they'll have a malt box that you just plug in, and you go, cool, I'm, I'm good. But if you're doing it live, you always got to have this ready in case the malt box goes down. Or if you get a question in the audience, you want to be able to get the question, too, as, as much as you can. I mean, as long as it's, it's legible. Again, you know, it's the absence of bad sound. If they can hear it and they can understand it, they're happy. You know, the people you work for, typically. Um, a press conference, I just did one. Um, I just worked in Sebring for the, the bank shooting in Sebring. I did that for ABC News. We did live shots for Good Morning America at, I don't know what time, early. Two press conferences at the police station, and then I did live shots for World News Tonight, and then I drove home. I worked 3 a.m. to 10 p.m. Those were my on-the-clock hours. I really, I mean, I only really only worked 4 a.m. till about 9.15, but with the union and everything, you get to add on buffers and all this kind of stuff. But the press, so the press conferences, and it's, it's crazy, because you probably got typically 10 or more cameras from the local stations. If it's a big story, you got the networks there too. And, and, and so like this, this one at the Sebring, there must have been 20 cameras there. But there were only about five or six sound men. And that's really at the net, up, upper level. You know, the local guys don't get a sound man. They just have to do it all themselves. So there was no malt box. So we all had to like get our microphones up on the podium that's what this comes in handy for. And this is the microphone. Where'd it go? Oh, it probably did fall. It's one thing about that microphone is you can hammer nails with it and it'll still work. It's an Electrovoice RE50. It's, it's a heavy, heavy mic. So you would just, I had to like put this up on the podium and everybody else had their mics up on those type of things, you know, kind of like, well, here's the clip. And I had to tape it down. It came off a couple times. It was crazy. And I mean, again, there's like, everybody's mic is up here with, with their flags. You know what mic flag is? It's a little thing that says, you know, NBC News or ESPN or whatever. I had an extended period working for ESPN when the, the year the Bucks won the Super Bowl. Pretty much, I was at the practice fields two or three times a week doing interviews and shooting B-roll of the game, of practice, and then on the field during the, for the games. For a one o'clock game, though, I would get there at eight o'clock in the morning, and we would do live shots starting at about 11 for ESPN. And then during the game was actually my easy time because there was no audio requirements. They just put two cameras in either end zone and shot the game. Plus, they could take anything they wanted from the feed. So I would get water, batteries, you know, that kind of stuff. And then after the game, we do the locker room craziness of guys standing in their jock straps while they're doing interviews. You know, it's something you don't really want to see. And I, you know, the other thing that I never understood about that is why don't they just give the guys a chance to put their pants on? I mean, it's really not that not that long, and it really make it look a lot better and make everybody more comfortable too. <laughs> Uh, and then after the games, we would do more live shots, kind of the wrap-up of the evening. And I would get out of there probably 9 or 10 o'clock. That was my day, shooting a football game. It was exciting, though. You're on the field, you know, the energy of 65,000 people. It's, it's amazing. It really is. It really is. Okay, so the next one. 
Oh, reality TV. A lot of us, and I've changed my mind over this in the last couple of years, but I remember 15 years ago, one of my cameramans called me and said, if, if I ever call you for a reality TV shoot, tell me we're not doing it. And I mean, I've had some, I did one, I married a princess. Casper Van Dien. Do you guys know who Casper, the actor Casper Van Dien? Exactly. And he was married to Catherine Oxenborg, who was also, also an actress, and she was like the grand niece of the former king of Yugoslavia. So she was a princess. And between them, they had six kids. And it was a crazy house. And I get there, and I mean, I have no idea what I'm going to. This cameraman hires me and says, I got a job in Sarasota. I'm like, OK. And I'm using his equipment. I get there, and they're like, well, how many wireless do you have? I was like, two. And she's like, well, I guess it'll do for now. And I'm thinking, holy crap, what did I get in? She's like, oh, don't worry about it. Scott will be here tomorrow. Scott will handle it. Scott shows up. He's got a bag. Oh, my god, it weighs 60 pounds. <clears throat> it had a hard drive, eight-track recorder with seven wireless and the boom in it. I was like, <clears throat> he's like, yeah, but man, I'm working all the time. I'm like, yeah, but when you're 50, you're going to walk around like this. You're not going to be able to move. And he's like, I don't care. I'm like, OK. And it was about then I was like, yeah, reality TV. Oof. And I mean, the producer said things. One of the cameraman overheard them saying, well, it's, you know, they're a local crew. We really shouldn't expect too much and that kind of thing. We were like, yeah, <laughs> OK. But I mean, I've had better experiences, like the Siesta Key thing was good. Um, I've done things with like cheerleaders, where I've had their coaches all mic'd up and getting all the reactions of during the competitions and all these types of things. But um, the main thing for reality TV is that you're going to need a lot of wireless systems. You're going because they're going to want everybody mic'd, everybody, and they're going to want the mics hidden. Siesta Key. Ugh. Miking girls in bikinis. And literally, the audio supervisor told me, now the transmitters were smaller. They were probably about that big. OK? Take the top stick, and right here, where like their bra strap, or the bikini top strap is, stick it to their back. And then tape it with clear tape. I was like, really? And then, and then run it underneath and clip it underneath the triangle, or stick it underneath the triangle right here. And it worked. And, it's, and surprisingly, the cameramen, if they saw it, they'd avoid it. They would move, or they, you know, they adjusted. And so it was really amazing. I, because I'm so used to it has to be totally hidden. I mean, totally hidden. And with a bikini top, there's really nowhere to put the transmitter, especially ones this big. So that's that's one of the reality TV st stories. I'm trying to think what other, what other things I've done on reality TV. No, I guess that's it. OK, so now I'm going to go over some of the microphones and some of the different tools that, that we use. I brought some of my older stuff. This is one of my old mixers. This is a, um, a Sound Devices 442. This was the industry standard for, for years. Um, it's got four mic, in, four mic or line inputs that can be switched just like that. I mean, it's really simple. Um, all these are different outputs if you want to multi feed a multi-track. I mean, in the day, that was pretty unique. It's also got a multi-pin out so you can feed two cameras if you needed to. And these are actually extra outputs for feeding wireless systems. In the network news business, you don't have a cable between you and the camera. You transmit, you have a wireless system between your bag and the camera that feeds the audio to the camera. And he wears headphones and listens to make sure that everything's good. So that was kind of how those developed. But then the multi-tracks came in, and everybody pretty much is doing multi-track mixers. If you don't have, because they want it, they want the backup. They'll, they still kind of want you to feed the camera, but they're not that concerned about it. And, and pretty much since the digital cameras came in, in my opinion, the audio on them sucks. It's, it's way below standard. When I started in the, in the mid-90s, pretty much the main camera you had to have if you wanted to work was a Sony D600. 
It was a, one of the first digital front end cameras. It still had an analog tape deck, beta, beta SP, but it had really nice XLR switchable inputs, liner mic, and nice metering and everything. And you really, I could get good audio on that camera. As soon as the, they went out of that realm and the back end became digital, the audio kind of just didn't seem as good, didn't sound as good, at least to my ears. And your ears are still going to be your best judge of whether it's good or bad. It's always going to be. How much audio do you do in post? None. 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 Personally or it's just not done? I personally, I do none. Okay. I mean, I have Logic on my, comp on my Mac, and I do mostly music on it. Okay, so we, we see movies of people m making movies. And they have, a lot of times they have in, in the back office, they have people redoing the lines. Mm -hmm. And you don't get involved in that? No. I, I want to, that's one of my main goals on set, is to avoid having them have to get ADR later. ADR, that's what it's called? Yeah, okay. or Foley. I just, did a, I just did a feature film just a couple months ago. Um, Oliver Robbins was the director. Oliver played the son in the original Poltergeist. Okay? They called me, it was pretty much a, a really, re, I mean, extremely micro-low budget. They called me on it last year when they first shot it, and the producer was like, well, I'm not even going to insult you by offering you this, but if you really want to work on it, I was like, that's okay, thanks. And I mean, people were working like on a percentage. They weren't even getting the day rate out of it or anything like that. And so, and I talked to the producer later, and he's like, oh, man, I wish you had been there. I really wish you'd been there. I'm like, mm, got to get a budget for it, you know. And so they brought me in on two pickup days. And I gave Oliver a little wireless headset so he could hear all my audio all day. And he kept walking around going, man, it sounds so good. Man, it sounds so good. And I'm thinking to myself, who'd you have before? <laughs> you know? Who did this to you? Made you feel like, wow, man. So those are some of the things, you know, you get, um, some of you probably have had bad experiences with that with people who know audio. And, and I've, I mean, I, I messed up when I first started too. But you slowly get used to it. Now this is one of the cables that I would use to feed the camera. It has the multi-pin that will come out of the mixer. And then um, two XLRs to feed the camera and, wherever it is, a headphone return. Because if you're recording on the camera, you want to listen off the camera. And the mixers have a little switch where you can listen off your mixer or you can listen off the camera. Um, actually, this one, will, I can monitor up to three cameras. This is the mixer I have here is, and you, I'll show it to you more in detail when, afterwards. It's a Sound Devices 688 recorder mixer. It's a 12 input, 16 track recorder. It has six XLR inputs, which are these kind. And all, all inputs are female and all things like this are going to be, things that go in are going to be male. Um, and then it has TA3Fs, which are like little bitty XLRs, and then they have, and they have limited fu functions on the mixer compared to the XLRs. So I, I, I bought the big one. There is a smaller version that's only six channels, but I bought the 12-channel one because I do music too. Um, that's something I didn't even tell you guys about in my history is I started volunteering at WMNF in, in 2004, and slowly I, I engineered the news, um, stuffed envelopes, sorted pledge sheets. One time they gave me a stack of pledge sheets like this big one time and said, alphabetize them, please. And it took me about three hours and I did it. <coughs> but that's how WMNF is. You have to prove your dedication and then opportunities happen. And now I've done, for the last 10 or 12 years, I've mixed the live music showcase on Friday, which we have live bands come into our studio every week. Just yesterday I had a four-piece band, kind of a gypsy jazz kind of group. It was fun. Um, so that's, that's the other thing I do. So let's go back to where was it? Mixers. This mixer has so many different capabilities. Um, it generates its own tone. And you can, it gets really loud if you need it to. Um, basically what it does is it records a left-right of your mix just like any mixer would. 
but then it also records every microphone, every channel isolated. So you have a trim for the, for the isolated one, then you have the pot is actually for the left-right mix. And this just does left-right mix. That's all it does. Most mixers are like that. Most, if it's not a recorder, a multi-track recorder, although they have, Sound Devices has a 552 that is, it's a five-channel mixer with a two-track recorder in it, which in the old days we would use that for like transcriptions or something like that. We were still recording on the cameras. Light drives me crazy. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit about these the wireless systems. This is the transmitter and that's the receiver. They both run off, newer ones run off, run off different things, but they both run off uh, 9 volts. For this one, it's just a compartment right there. You just kind of pull this and it opens up. And this one's kind of like, like that. But, and I've gone with the um, rechargeable 9 volts. These are made by um, iPower. This battery costs $25, but I use it 10 times, it's paid for itself. If not even that, really, because you, and the other thing was why I did, the main reason I did this is sometimes you're out in the middle of nowhere and you need 9 volts, and you end up going to a convenience store, and you end up buying four of them for $30. <laughs> and Two of them have full energy, and the other two have about half energy. And you're just like, oh, man, crap. So that's why I went with this, so I know what I have at all times. I can always go back. I can always go to Publix and, and buy a bunch of 9 volts or something if I need to, but I always have these, and they've saved me. So these are, um, this just has a regular XLR out. It also has a little power thing, which my whole bag runs off of one battery this. It's an NP1 battery, um, lithium, I think it's 66 amp hours or something like that. It'll run this bag with three wireless running for about 10 hours probably, which is so convenient. Think about if you had each individual item batteried by itself. One would go wrong and you have to stop. Another one would go wrong then you have, and you have to stop every time and they're like, Waiting on sound, and you're like, no, I don't want, to wait. don't want you waiting on sound. I hate those words. I hate those words. <laughs> so that's um, the lobs. There's a lot of different lobs. Um, I showed you the Sankins. These are what we call a top burner because the, the, the capsule is basically the sound is absorbed through the top. Um, but I also have other ones here. These are Tram brand. And this is more of a square capsule. I don't know if you can see how that is. But the, the capsule is a little square right there on the front. So it would be like this. Um, those were my standard ones for a long, long, long time. I loved trams. My friend in Orlando, Tom, who works at the audio company, he and I had discussions on how wonderful trams were. And then I got on a shoot just last year, where they used, where is it, moleskin. They would, take, they would cut it up into little one-inch squares and take this mic and stick moleskin on the front with just maybe just a little bit of the mic sticking out like that, and then another piece on the back, and then just stick it on the t-shirt. I mean, and talent put the mic on themselves, and we had no clothing noise for four days. And I was like, I have to have some of those. So the next day I bought two of them. <laughs> and um, life has changed since then. It's like a lot easier. Um, these things make it easier to hide the mics. But there's a lot of techniques. There's actually a Facebook page on techniques to hide lavaliers. There's also one called I Need an Audio Person. I actually had a job where I got um, 
they called me one day. I guess I screwed up or something. Um, they called me and said, we're not going to need you on Saturday. Okay. Stuff happens. Things change. Not a big deal. Friday afternoon, I see on the website, we need an audio person. I was like, what? <laughs> so I, I, texted, I texted the production manager, and I didn't get a response, but that ad went down like instantly. I was like, okay. I got replaced, and I talked to another friend of mine who was on the set. He's like, yeah, man, they brought in a guy from Tallahassee for that. They spent a lot of money replacing you. I'm like, okay. You know, you're going to make mistakes. Let it go. You're going to be on set. You're going to make mistakes. You're just, you got to believe in yourself and realize that, you know, what you give. I mean, I've been on so many sets where I'm intimidated by all these people around me. I mean, because think about it. When you're on a commercial set, there's probably 20 or 30 people who are worried about visuals. And you're the only person who's worried about audio. I mean, the director and the producer value you because they know they're paying you and they want you there. And they, they, they know that they'll, they'll get the right tools and the right elements that they need for their thing. But nobody else does. I mean, the grips are like, pfft. one of my friends in Atlanta, he has a little cart for his sound stuff. He has a little sign that says, place key light here. Because no matter where you set up, I take my bag, I put it right here, and the, and the grips will come up. Um, I need to put a light there. OK. Hey, Mark, is this your stuff over here? Um, yeah, I need to put a light there. OK, well, where, where would be good for me? Oh, how about like up around the corner here? I did one in Clearwater, a commercial the other day with, with Bryce um, Harper. He's the, uh, the Philly who's getting 330 million contract. Um, and it was a commercial for a barber shop that he's a part owner. And all the people were getting the Bryce haircut. <laughs> and it was just really funny. Um, all right, again, I lost my train of thought, but that's OK. All right, so next, um, let's talk about the boom mic. Now this. This is pretty much a standard boom pole. This is a Vandenberg brand. Oop. Oh, I just unplugged my computer. That's not a big deal. It's not very heavy until you extend it. And then it gets really heavy, especially if you have to stand like this for a long day and you're going following somebody. It gets tiresome. But you learn, I mean, you learn how to hold it, you get stronger, and so you can control the knobs. A lot of people do this, they'll have their headphones on, and um, they'll balance the thing on the top of their head, which doesn't quite work all the time, but it's not too bad. Kind of do this. No. No, you can, um, but typically, typically booms are condenser mics, and they're, they're going to need 48 volt power. And very few of the, tr of the re transmitters are, are come that way. You have to have them specially designed to, to, to provide 48 volt. They'll provide 12 volt for the lobs, but they won't provide 48 volt. Uh, that's one big thing about microphones is you've got to know all these mixers um, like this is a dynamic microphone. It does not require any power. This is a condenser microphone. It does require some kind of power. This is a Sheps. I wa I, I've wanted one of these mics for 25 years when I first worked with it years ago with my friend David. And I finally got one three years ago. And it is so sweet. And it's so small and so light. Before I had this thing, on the end of the pole. And this has another, this has a Sennheiser mic inside it. This is, this is called the Windjammer, and this is called the Zeppelin. Um, and it just comes apart like this. And there's the other microphone. 
This was my <coughs> first microphone that I owned. I paid $1,200 for it in 1992, which at the time was a lot of money. It really was. But it's, 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 it's been the workhorse. It's, it's, it's pretty much an industry standard. You can still buy them for around 1000 they're, they're kind of So they're still valued pretty high. But um, once I started using this little mic, I was like, I don't need that Zeppelin anymore. Thank you. But um, it's one thing you'll, you're going to, if you're going to do sound, the technology is changing so fast. Um, it's going to be hard to keep up. And I've noticed this in the cameras, too. Is every time I'm on a set, there's a new camera. And I'm like, well, how does this one work? And uh, luckily, there's an assistant camera person there who knows the camera. And, um, but you have responsibilities as far as the camera goes, because um, I'm going to go into that a little bit, too. And that has to do with um, syncing the camera with the audio. Now, we all know the clapper and how that works and everything. But nowadays, the cameras are so much more advanced that, I mean, all cameras in the old days had time code inputs. And pretty much your bag generates the time code for the set, which if you notice, we're on iPhone time right now. Because <laughs> um, I always set my phone to, the, to my iPhone. So I can just say to the director, just, just keep, if you want to keep track, just write down the time from your phone and it'll be exact. Even like um, within seconds even. So this, this slating is pretty much the standard way. In the old days, we didn't have any, any display. It was just a matter of clapping. And you, could, you had the visual of it coming together. And then with the tape, you could roll it back and forth and find that clap noise and mark it. And then you could line them up, hopefully. I mean, I never had to do it, but <laughs> a little bit out of my element. And then time code came in so that you have a display. You're still, um, you're still clapping it, but really they're going to use this. And this matches what's right here that I'm looking at. And one thing I want to tell you guys is you don't have to slam these things. I mean, it literally needs to be that much noise for it to be slated. It doesn't have to be, it needs to be that much noise. That's all it needs to do. Erasable marker with what they call a mouse. So you write on it. I don't know if I have one that writes. I know I do. I know I brought some. Okay. So he would write blah, blah, blah on the front. Take one. Typically, if you have a really good assistant camera, they'll, either, they'll like have a label maker. And they'll, put, they'll make labels for all this information. And then you're just doing this, changing this. Well, you pretty much, on a big shoot, you'll hand this off to the assistant camera, and he'll take care of it. Um, and he'll work with keeping track. Um, but I can, like, with, within my mixer, say it's, it's scene 104 take one, I can set my mixer so that that file name for that take is 104 take one. Exactly. I can do all that stuff within this. It's all menu driven. It's one thing in the old days, nothing was menu driven. It was always, it's a, one of my jokes is if you're not, if things aren't working, it's going to be one switch. One switch or one setting that's going to be messing you up and you got to find it. But it's there. You just got to find it. So I can set all this up to match. And now they also have um, sync boxes, which I have an older one here. And basically what you do is this, is you feed the time code out of your mixer into this, and then this sits on the camera and feeds the, the camera time code continuously. Because nowadays, like that commercial I shot with Kevin Pillar, most of that stuff was shot high speed, like 60, 48 frames per second or more. So there's no way to match the audio. So it was just kind of crazy with the way they did it. Um, 
So the sync box pulls it back as soon as they go back to normal speed. The sync box kicks in and has the time code match you. So in the reality world, that's better because you don't have to slate all the time. They just want to roll because if you've got to go like this in front of somebody, it, it ruins the spontaneity. On a commercial set, no, they don't care. Just do it, you know. Put it right in their face. Right in their face. All right, so let me think what else. I do have an old recorder here that I bought. This is a digital Tascam two channel. Actually has XLRs in it and actually has a time code capability too. Um, this was only like 800 bucks. So if you need a decent two channel mixer, I mean, even the zooms they have out nowadays, you can get usable audio. I mean, the sync, syncing part is gonna be a little tricky. But I mean, a lot of people tell me, oh, we got software that'll just they can just handle that without any problem. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, I've never really, my editing days were before I went freelance in 1991 and we worked on, the place I worked, we had three quarter inch SP tape. They were this thick, like that big. You had two decks, source decks, you had a record deck you had a big video switcher in front of you to make the transitions. You had a character generator. You had a digital video effects that would make everything fly around and all those kind of things. You had an audio mixer. You had a reel-to-reel. -reel. You had all these CD players and all this stuff for all this input. Now it's all that stuff is in here. All of it is in here. So I never really learned how to edit in here. But knowing how to edit helped me on jobs because I could say to the producer, it won't match. Something's not right here, you know. What's the industry uh, standard for editing? I've worked on audio, uh, I don't know. Adobe Suite. I don't know. Final Cut Pro, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Premiere Pro, uh, Avid is actually still. Yeah, Avid still, Avid was always pretty big. Avid was one of the first ones who, who really came out into it. But again, being a sound man, and once I went freelance, I left the edit suite. I never went back. Um, and I, I really prefer it because I'm on the location. I'm seeing the activity or whatever is going on. I'm, I'm kind of part of it even. I mean, I did a story, the shooting in, the, in Clearwater where that guy shot the guy at a convenience store. I rode in the back of the car with Trayvon Martin's little brother. You know, because they were part of that story. They showed up for the, the church service and everything. I mean... You never know who you're going to hang out with. Had days like Shaquille O'Neal is somebody, just when you work with him, he will walk up to every person on the set. How you doing, man? How you, what's your, what's your name? What, what do you do? Nice to meet you, man. That's how he is. I mean, everybody. He's just wonderful. Other people, are they're like, yeah, you're not even there. They like, oh, yeah, thanks, guys. And they just kind of walk off. You just deal with it. <clears throat> But I had an interesting thing. Well, Warren Sapp one time gave me an interesting experience. We were at his house, and um, it was for CNNSI, which was CNN and Sports Illustrated had joined forces for a little while. And we were doing a feature on him and his wife. And we, the cameraman and I were loading up at the truck, and I heard the producers at the door saying goodbye to him. And I was just kind of like, oh, well, I guess I won't get to say goodbye. Not a big deal. Next thing I know, Warren's standing at the back of our truck going, hey, guys, see you later. I was like, wow, he really cares about us. And I mean, he, you know, I hate to say bad about anything, but he had a reputation of being a little abrasive, shall we say. But he explained that to me one day. He said, you know how many people just come up to me and say, give me your autograph? They don't ask. They don't thank. They, just their expectation. He says, it got old really fast. And when you're at that level, there are so many people asking for this much of your time. Just, just a little bit of your time. But they, you know, it's, it gets to be way too much. Another thing you're going to have to be concerned about within, um, within the camera, you'll work with, the, on a big shoot, you'll work with the ACs, the assistant camera people with this. But... The cameras all shoot different frame rates. Pretty much the standard now is 2398, 
which is just like, it's kind of like we used to shoot 30 frames in video, always was 30 frames. Film was 24 frames. Um, they've, I mean, with the digital world, the video, video went to 24, but then they came out with 2398. I guess it's the, it has more of a film look to it. But again, I don't, I don't even look at the monitor most of the time on set. Just if I do, it's to see if my mic is, is showing on the talent or if my boom is in the shot or something like that or where the framing is so I know where I can get my boom in. And a lot of times, if I can't get the boom in close enough and the audio is not good, I need to go to the director and say, they need to change the framing so I can get this audio. And they will, typically, if they want it. A lot of times they'll say, don't worry about it. We're going to do close-ups, too. And if they do close-ups, you got it. Don't even worry, because they'll use the whole close-up audio, hopefully. I mean, I, again, I don't edit, so I don't even want to think about it. So, um, but these, this thing, if you look on this back here, right here, it has a switch for all these different frame rates. Um, 30 drop frame, 29 drop frame, 39 drop, 29 non-drop, 25, 24, 23. I mean, there's a lot of different frame rates that can be, be had here, and this thing will just handle it all. But you just got to know. To sync this thing is kind of an interesting little, little trick. Turn it off. Have a cable out of the mixer. This is a Limo cable, if you know what a Limo connector is. It's a five pin Limo. It plugs into the slate like this. And then you turn it on. And if you get the little, little dot blinking it a second, it's synced. And it'll stay like that pretty much all day. I mean, we do check it frequently just to make sure, but 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's pretty, pretty self plants. Um, okay, let me think what else do I have here? Some of the things that you might need, or you will need, a cable tester. $25, Guitar Center online, different things like that. Um, the 9 volts, I love these little containers that they came out with. Oh, <laughs> small XLRs. This whole bag, all these, these are my two trans, my wireless transmitters that are in the bag. They have power. Um, that's actually something I, sh I should show you. This whole bag runs off of this, this battery. And I just have a switch here and I turn the whole bag on at once. I did explain why I have the one battery. I know I did that. Okay. So um, you're going to need these for, for in the bag. Here's, here's an interesting one. One of the cameras, um, an Alexis, has a stereo XLR input. So this is my cable to feed cameras, and it has a detachable end on it. Let's see, which end is it? Yeah. It comes apart right here. So that's got two mono XLRs. And then I just plug this one. I shouldn't really get my cables untangled here. <laughs> I knew when I did this, when I put this mic on, I should have done it better. But you know, it was one of those things. And then this just plugs in right here again. And I'm feeding the camera with the stereo one. This is made by Remote Audio. And there's a bunch of different companies. Look online. Some of the websites. My favorite place right now to buy stuff is True Audio, T R E W dot com. They're based in Indianapolis. Um, they know their stuff. They have everything available. You can just go online and order it, and it comes boom, boom. Not much, not much. Just these XLRs and the cable tester. This is, it's very, what I have up here is very video specific. I mean, the microphones have multiple, like, I mean, this mic could be, is a, could be a very good vocal mic. I had an instance where um, 
I'm at a Buccaneers game, and I have Leroy Selman and this reporter standing on camera talking. And they each have one of these. And I mean, it's, it's while the teams are running off the field and the crowd's just going, Raw! and they're standing like this talking to me and I hear every word clearly. Just because the, the way this, the, the pickup of this microphone is that it blocks everything else out and gets rid of it and just does this, picks up right here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is pretty much the standard mic. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I want to tell you about the shotgun mics that I didn't, didn't really explain. Because um, we all know the, the, the term shotgun mic. But what I, want to, I want to describe to you what, why that is what it is. It's directional. Kind of get that idea. But what, what makes it directional? Why is it directional? You see the grills on the side? And you got grills on the front here. What happens is it picks up the sound from the front. And with the side grills, it puts out some of the sound on each side that's opposite phase of each other. So it cancels out all that side noise. And only the noise that's in front gets picked up. I mean, that's a little technical for you. But that's just the general idea is that it cancels out the side noises through the technology. OK. Oh, OK. Some other things. Gaffer's tape. Don't ever believe that, that duct tape is the same thing. It's not. And this roll is 15 bucks. OK? But what makes it unique is that the gum on it doesn't melt. You can put this on a hot light. You can put this on anything, and it won't melt. And this stuff is its pretty durable. If you know how to rip it, it's, it's easy. <laughs> Where do you get your gas? Um, true audio. Yep. No, I'll let, when you come up, you can feel it. It's, it's, got, a whole, it's got a cloth element to it. Mm -hmm. And you use it for everything. I mean, if you go to a production store, like, like an actual production store, that same roll is thirty dollars. Yeah. If you go to an audio store, it's fifty bucks. Yeah. Um, they have they have what they call gaffer's tape, like at Sam Ash and Guitar Center, but it's not the same thing. The glue's not the same. It's not as good. Oh, here's another thing that I need to tell you about: Comtex, or what they call them IFBs, which it's interrupted something. I forget what it's called. It's an engineering term. Basically, it's a wireless headset. And I've been on commercial shoots. <laughs> they call me two days before. Um, how, many, how, many, how many headsets do you have? And I said, two. And they go, oh, we need 15. I have the sources to get 15. I get them 15. And I charge them for each one of those. And I'm going, yeah, nice. I used six of them. OK. I've had so many shoots, oh, we need 12 of them. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Really? You're not going to use them. I'll get them. No problem. And we just, I mean, we all laugh. The sound, we all laugh between each other because, yeah, they want that many, but we're not going to use that many. So basically, you have receiver or transmitter takes the output of your bag through an eighth inch mini cable which that mixer has an eighth inch mini left right out, so I typically use that. It has other things that you can assign. And then these are the receivers that the producers will wear on their hip or whatever. I have extra headphones if they need them, but most people nowadays have their own that they prefer. And you know, I just say, do you have your own or do you need some? And they go, oh, I got them. Don't worry about it. These can also be used um, as a camera hop. And what I mean by camera hop is a wireless between your bag and the camera. Now, when I said before, using a wireless system, that was to get usable audio. This is not necessarily usable audio. This is more like a reference for them when the editor just say, oh, well, that's, I can match up the audio from his take with this, and it'll be good. And then you have, so you have a little XLR to mini cable from this out into the camera. And the trick, of, the trick about this is, and this is one of the things that messes with me, is 
most headphones are line level out. Do you guys know the difference between mic level and line level? OK, that's a pretty basic audio thing. Microphones don't put out the same amount of signal, so they have to be um, adjusted accordingly. Where a line level is a hot, is a really hot. Um, in, in decibels, it's a plus four, where a microphone would be negative 60 decibels. And so you've got to be able to adjust like that. A line level is way hotter. Typically, headphone levels are all line level. So if you're using, like I would take, like an output, if I had a CD player that I had to use as a source, I would take this and plug it into the headphone jack of the, and plug it into my mixer and put my mixer on line level, and I got it. Works fine. I do that on the cameras, however, and I don't get anything. And we're like, what? And the cameras, you know, most cameras are designed to have a, a microphone mounted on them, so they have. 48 volt powering within their system. You turn the 48 power volt on it, this thing works. It's just one of those things that I happened to learn haphazardly on a shoot. Somebody says, well, did you try the 48 volt thing? I was like, what do you mean? I don't know that one. And it worked. I was like, cool. Another little thing that comes in handy is this. It's a harness for this. Think about you got a woman in a dress. Say it's a real slinky dress or something like that. You can't have this thing on her bra. She doesn't have a bra on even. You can't have this thing on her bra. You can't put it on her underwear. <laughs> Channel, ten, Channel 8 locally, all their reporters, they, they just changed this a couple years ago. All their on-camera women wear dresses. And to get overcome that problem, they bought what they call technical pants. And they're tan covered pants that they wear that are like, I don't know, they, they kind of look like jammies. But, and they, you clip the transmitter onto that. And I did a commercial for them. They're like, yeah, I got my technical pants on. Go for it. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know. OK. I get teased all the time, you get to mic all the women. And I'm like, yeah, I get to mic all the sweaty men, too. <laughs> so it has its advantages, you know. All right, so I think I'm pretty much done. <laughs> I had to today come in here. I had to use my equipment to get the audio out of my computer. And into this, I actually had to take, because there was a mic input here on the floor, and again, my Headphone out is line level, so I have a converter here that converts it from line to mic level, and then I was able to feed the house mic level. Well, how do you approach um, like frequencies when you go out of market? Or oh boy, that's a good one. Um, because the FCC in the last couple of years sold off our frequencies. So the blocks I have, I have four wireless systems. Actually, I have six wireless systems, but two of them are, are old ones. They're VHF fixed frequency, um, 171.905 and 209. Um, I was actually, early on in, the sh in my shooting days, in 1993, I had a job. Um, and there were three sound men. We were supposed to be the behind-the-scenes crew for BB. B.B. King in um, Gainesville. And B.B.'s come into this road prison in Gainesville that has like a drug rehab system within it. And come to find out his daughter is in the nearby female facility. And that's why he's coming to Gainesville. So we get there and we do a bunch of B-roll of the, of the, you know, the prison and all this kind of stuff. But then I find out B.B.'s giving a concert there that afternoon. Like, really? Far out. So BB comes and gives the concert. And the main sound guy was this guy, Ned, from, from LA. All of us, all three of us, had a 171.905 wireless. It was like a traveling frequency or something like that. So that's what we used for the board feed. I had the board feed in my head the whole day. It was beautiful. And I mean, even then, it was the days where we got hits and stuff like that, but it was the best we had. Once the VHF ones came out, 
the or the UHF ones came out, the V's were gone. They were they were worthless. So back, let me go back to what I was saying. So the FCC has sold off a lot of these blocks. Um, these wireless actually will scan their whole block and show you what's open. You just hit the buttons all continuously, and it'll scan the whole, the whole block. But I only have about probably a year left on, on these systems because the, the blocks have been sold off for personal use items, cell phones, walkie-talkies, all types of stuff like that. Um, there are new ones available. I'm in the market now looking at new ones because I have to have wireless. I mean, that's, that's a given. I will probably buy a stereo electrosonics one probably around $6,500, but that's three blocks, and they're all clear. Is electro stuff more standard in your realm than the, the Sennheiser stuff? The Mostly because of durability. When you got a cast aluminum case, I mean, especially transmitters. What happens with this typically is I'll have talent sitting in a chair for an interview like this, and I'll clip the lav on them. And I don't need to put this on their belt because they're just sitting. So I'll just set it on the ground or set it on the chair next to them, and they get up and start walking away. And the transmitter goes, bam. <laughs> and I'm like, you know. <laughs> You know, and they're like, oh, sorry. And you're like, oh, if you only knew how much that cost, please. <laughs> this system right here was $2,500. OK, I have four of them. I bought two of them used, though, so I got them a little bit discount. But um, all right, so any, any other questions? Standard kind of thing? No, most of the time I have a standard package. The standard package is the mixer, two laws, and a boom. If they want anything else beyond that, it's extra. And they pay for it. You pick it up and make it. I have most of it. <laughs> if I can, I provide it myself or I have friends. I mean, there's 20 different sound men in this market, and we, we share equipment, we share jobs. You know, if you can't do it, I'll give it to somebody else. Um, I got a possibility for a job in April. It's going to be three or four weeks traveling around South Carolina doing a reality TV show. And so I picked one of my friends as the other sound man to go with me. I was like, well, I figured who, who would I like to travel with? And I picked my friend Jamie. It was like, it works. Um, but it, it varies. It varies. Um, every job is different. Your rate for you will stay the same, but the equipment is always where you can be flexible. Um, a, lot of, a lot of guys, if, if the job is enough days, some people will give them the equipment for free. I mean, but I'm, I'm not in that place anymore. <laughs> you know, I try not to get those. I mean, even like that feature I did with Oliver Robbins, that was a, a extremely low budget. I think I made, actually I turned down a day in Daytona where I, I would have made twice as much as I made in those two days. So, but I made a commitment to them and I wanted to keep it. And, you know, having features in, on my resume does look good, you know. So, but I have to say this too. The last time someone asked for my resume was probably 10 years ago. I've been doing this, I mean, I've been doing exclusively sound since 93, 92, 93. So, I mean, I feel pretty confident when I walk on set that I have a good idea what's going on. You know, I mean, that's kind of the reassuring factor of what, I, what I'm working is like, I might be in over my head here, but I, I've got experience under my belt. I'm, I probably can overcome this and figure this out. All right, any other questions? Um, each gig will have insurance for you. Typically, typically if, 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 if I'm on set and equipment gets broken, I'm responsible for it unless talent was responsible for it getting broken. I mean, Siesta Key, we had three wireless transmitters go in the pool. 
Yeah, all of a sudden, it was crazy. And the next day, th three more were there ready to be used. I mean, it was like, no big deal. It's understood that if things get broken, they're gonna, production will pay for it, yes. Um, but it does vary. I mean, for years I worked with local cameramen who didn't really have budgets. I mean, I would have to wait for them to get paid for me to get paid, you know, those kind of things. Um, and I mean, I remember one time he, cameraman just went down like this and picked his camera up and my umbilical here was underneath it <coughs> And this thing just popped off. I mean, it just broke right, broke right off. And he was like, sorry, dude. And I was like, all right, well, that's $200 I got to replace, you know. And all I got was a sorry for it. But he was a regular client. I mean, I've been working with him for 20 years. And I wasn't going to nickel and dime him about something like that. But you have to, um, I mean, there's nothing worse than being on a set with gear that doesn't work. It'll drive you. Talk about stress. And I mean, I joke around and say electronic equipment has personalities. It's like some day they want to work and other days they don't want to work. And it's just weird. I mean, and with wireless frequencies, you never know where you're going to go and what's going on. I mean, I've, I've heard stories of guys being on set where the local um, phone utility company shows up and asks them to change the frequency because they're creating interference with something. So you never know what's going to create interference. I mean, a, a telephone wire or anything like that could create a lot of noise for you. Um, rain. Oh, God, rain. Don't even go into rain. The nice thing about rain is the cameras don't like rain either, so they're not going to shoot in the rain. So you, could, <laughs> you kind of get away with, from it. Um, but I have had shoots. I had one. What was, that? was that a commercial? It was a United Way th scene. It was a wedding scene with this couple on a, on a dock at a lake. And it was like sunrise. It was a beautiful shot. Two minutes after we started ro rolling, the rain came down in buckets. And I mean buckets. I was able to keep my bag dry with my raincoat and everything like that. But I mean, the couple got soaked. And the director was like, embrace it. <laughs> And they did. There was like, they, we worked through it. But I remember sitting on that dock, hunched over my bag, holding my pole, just going, please don't get wet, please don't get wet, please don't get wet. All right, so let's see, other, let's show another video. All right, well, let's go back to questions. Any other questions? I knew there were a couple other hands. I have a question about when you're recording with a mixer. So are you recording uh, individual tracks onto this mic? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, individual tracks. That's the median. So when you're deli doing it, like delivering to the editor or whoever it's going to be dealing with, uh, you're delivering individual tracks for each mm -hmm. amount of tracks, I guess. Mm -hmm. Would you do background and stereo tracks as well? It does have a left right mix as well, yes. It's a 16. Well, the six, well, you'd have to set up another mic for that. In the video world, they won't use it. Typically, you'll get room tone. Uh, let me ex explain what room tone is. At the end, if you're doing an interview or any scene, always get, and I mean always, unless you know that you've recorded a blank time where no one was talking of the room, but always get room tone and, and leave the lights on, leave everybody in position, because you want that environment to be exactly how it was while you were doing the dialogue. Record 30 seconds of that room tone. And the director will, if he's good, he'll make sure everybody's quiet and get that room tone. Because then what they'd use that for is when they cut scenes, they may take the dialogue out of this take and the, the another take, but they have a gap in between, you know, and they cut your room tone in between there so there's no, no change in the audio. Because you would hear that background noise go down. Twenty-four bit, forty-eight hundred, forty-eight thousand. I mean, beyond that, there's to me, there's no difference. I mean, <laughs> forty-four one is fine for me. I mean, you know, 
and it converts to a CD real easy. <laughs> All right, what other questions? OK. Let's see, what's the other one I want to show? Where I come from, there's always salsa on the table. My salsa recipe is actually my mother's salsa recipe, and now it's my turn to pass it on. I'm very proud to be Canadian, but I'm also proud of my culture, so keeping family traditions alive is very important to me. Salsa is sauce. The word literally means sauce, and everybody's got their own recipe. Good salsa needs three things. It's gotta be chunky, which means using the right tomatoes, it's gotta be spicy, which means using the right peppers. And above all else, it's gotta be fresh. And that means growing your own vegetables. This is my grocery store. Fresh organic tomatoes, peppers, onions, garlic, cilantro. I have friends who also use corn, beans, or even fruit in their salsa. But I am a purist. Beef steaks tomatoes are pretty good, but you can't beat Roma. Sweet, firm, not too juicy, which is actually better for sauce. They also have fewer seeds, which makes things easier. You always want to remove the seeds or the pulp waters down your salsa, and nobody wants that. I use a fair bit of salt to draw out the moisture, but absolutely no black pepper. The only pepper in my salsa comes from my garden. I use jalapenos in Ana's salsa but the grown-ups get a full blast of habaneros if I'm feeling adventurous. The only problem is you can't make my mother's recipe without lime, and lime is a tropical fruit. I wouldn't have even thought it was possible to grow them in Canada, but Home Depot showed me how. It took a little effort, but now I grow my own limes. There's a special satisfaction in eating food you grew yourself. It's the taste of home. By the way, that was shot in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, have, I have a question about that, too. Uh, okay. Where did you acquire the audio? Well, I... From these little speakers, it sounds like you got it in a... You didn't obviously get it in a studio, but you got it on location. That was all shot on location. All outside the, or inside? Also, all where, where it was shot. And so you used the uh, shorter... I used the boom and, and the lavalier, both, yes. They usually take one of the other. Shorter one, the new one that you just bought. This one. The long one. Yeah, this is my my the one right. my main one I use anymore, just because it's such a better mic. It's it's the 416 is is a really good mic. Um, it it has more of a a tinier mid range. Yeah. Then this one's warmer and has has this is a very narrow pattern where the Sheps has a little bit of a wider pattern, so you don't have to be exactly right on. Um, you know, I could get, I could get him like this, whereas the shot, this, the 416, I'd almost have to be right on top of him where this one has a little bit more vary. I was impressed that there were multiple locations, obviously, where she was speaking from, but the audio was consistent. Do you use limiting or compression at all? In no. Or? No, in the field, you don't want to do anything. No EQ. I, I do have a limiter set, but it's a soft knee, and it only really kicks in when it ex it's extreme levels. I mean, I have it set up for that. Pretty much, <laughs> pretty much all that voiceover was recorded on the location at the time. Yeah, you want it to be all the same. Chopping on the chopping board there, was that just as she was speaking, or did you do that separately? That was all that done as she was, they were, that was B-roll that we shot separately. Well, we shoot it separately. We shoot it separately. Her, her on camera talking was shot, shot one way, and then all the stuff of her cutting and. The chopping just seemed it's almost like a Foley effect. I know, it's, I loved it. It popped out. So, when you, when you shop for mics, one of the things you guys are going to see are omnicardioid, um, super cardioid, this oh cardioid thing. Yeah. Um, In the production world, there's not so much. I mean, this, this is a super hyper cardioid. This is just a hypercardioid. So this is narrower. Um, and again, it's 
the cardioid is that it cancels out the side noise and only picks up what's really right in front of it. Uh, a microphone, I don't really have any other music microphones, but this one has a little bit, kind of like a ball around it. Yeah. Yeah, it is Omni. Yeah. And these are on, these, the tram, the lobs are Omni as well. Yeah. In the video world, there's really not that much. I mean, it's the, the shotguns, again, I mean, microphones are a matter of personal choice. You'll find ones that work for you and ones that won't, that you won't even like the sound of them. So you kind of got to go from there. Yeah. That's a shotgun mic. Placement. Placement. It's got to be close. The closer you can get to the person, the better. And again, right, you know, inches off the top of their head if you can. Think about, because headroom is pretty much standardized. And what I mean by headroom is the space from the top of the person's head to the top of the frame. Um, most camera people have a standard headroom and you can you know that so you can get your mic in there right at the edge of their headroom and that's how you want to do it as much as possible again your ears are going to tell you whether or not it's really good mm-hmm Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a balancing act. It kind of got a, um, it's funny, I, I just have this natural ability that I just hear things and I want to put them into the same. Exactly, because you, you identify already uh, the frequency of the each person, so that's why. And, and everybody, some people talk like this, exactly. and some people talk like this, and they're, in, and they're standing next to each yeah. other. And if you're booming it, mm -hmm. you got to be like going like this just in the pot, why, or, or going close to one person and going far away from the other person. I've done that a lot, okay. where I've had to be right on top of somebody and then come up for the other person. But you use uh, uh, how many microphones for this? Uh, for that one? Yes. Two. Uh, two. Yep, a lavalier and, and the boom. Oh, boom. Uh-huh. So the lavalier is probably picking up the shot. Yeah. No, that shot I just, well, both of them pick it up. I think like right, right in here, right in there. The little girls, I think I just stuck on her t-shirt. Did a little girl, I don't remember if she did. She didn't have any lines, so probably not. The boom would get anything she would say. All right. Yep. Now, how do you, would you like sort of have your own performance that you, you know, you sort of have to copy that person? Or do you just try to keep the mic at the same spot, you know, the same thing, all that? Um, if they're moving around, you stay with them. Well, I mean, even like, like their volume changes and all that. Well, one thing that I haven't said that is a standard thing that I really need everybody to understand. You want to peak. I mean peak. You want your meters to peak at negative 10, not zero, negative 10. Because you're going to have people who are going to go louder. And you set them so at negative 10 so you have that little bit of headroom to go up to zero or beyond, and it doesn't clip. Because digital doesn't distort. It just cuts. It just goes away. It doesn't go, you know, and create feedback and weird noises. It just goes away. It just, the noise is gone. There's nothing there anymore. So that's really undesirable. So you want to keep your meters, you want to keep them as high as possible. Well, see, again, this goes back to analog days. In the analog days, you want your signals as high as possible to minimize your signal to noise ratio. In, in the digital world, that's not really a factor anymore. The microphones 
have a little bit of noise, but not much. So you can pretty much crank it or not crank it, and you'll st you can if you record something accidentally really low, they can boost it in post, and it's fine. It's just a matter of changing, you know, the wavelength. It's not a big deal. All right. What other question? I saw somebody else's hand. All right. Here's another com few commercials I worked on, <laughs> and this one was funny. Um, it was another one where we're like, well, we're not sure how you're going to get audio today. And I'm like, really? And, um, well, these people are in costumes, fish costumes and bear costumes. And the bear costumes have fans inside them, so you can't put a lavalier inside. And the fish heads, well, the way the fish heads are, if you put one inside there, it'll sound like they're inside a room or something. And so that's not going to work. So why don't you just set up the boom and just kind of get Nat's sound of the day. And then we'll record the dialogue later. OK? <laughs> so here's one of those spots. Honey, have you seen our new neighbors? Oh, my. Yeah, just look at this guy. What does he think? Is he going to let that all by him? Oh, OK. Well, let's see how your back feels tomorrow, buddy. I think his back will be just fine. Huh? There's a new bear in town. Introducing Bear Paws Crackers, made with real fruits and veggies. Wow. Guitar. Go to your room. Bear Paws Crackers, the only kid's cracker, made with real fruits and veggies. All right. So let me think. Any other questions? Not anymore. These lithium batteries used to have an issue, but now they're making them, let me think, where are they? Now they're making them small enough or something. This one actually says on it, um, air transport safe. So they used to have an issue with lithiums, but they've overcome, they've worked that out, so the technology has changed. This is something you'll use. Condensed air, it cleans. Oh. A BNC cable, not an audio cable at all, but you will use it for the time codes. So if you have one, it'll help you out. Um, typically, this is used out of the camera for, to feed a monitor for the video or, or time code or whatever. Well, that's a good question because it depends on your comfort level with baggage handlers. Because if, you're, if your comfort level is low, I'm going to carry my stuff on. All right, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was pretty good.